Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Gnome Show After Dark. I am your host, Josh, and tonight I have for you The Awakening of Antarctica by Anomaly. Um, about 11 minutes and 40 seconds. Um, without further ado, let's jump into it. Antarctic Exploration Log, January 1962. Captain Neil Sorensen, leading the apocalypse operation. At a longitude of 77 tassics and latitude of 47.6, I note the arrival of the crew on Antarctic lands on January 12, 1962. After a brief stay in the Argentine city of Ushuaia to load the last provisions, we met with Dr. Nestor Sarso. He provided corrections to the coordinates of our points of interest in the exploration. Our encounter was truly helpful, as our calculations had a couple of serious errors, which might have led us several kilometers away from the budgeted site. Additionally, Dr. Sarso handed us a couple of substances in small metal boxes, suggesting their use in case things became dangerous although he didn't provide as much information as we would have liked. He assured us that if the occasion arose to use them, we should not take more than four hours to leave the area. We would appreciate it if we returned to the shores of Park Cabo de Hornos in Chilean territory without any incidents. He made it very clear that the contents of these boxes should not, under any circumstances, be ingested by us or anything we might encounter. Uh -oh. In the early morning of January 12th, we landed on Antarctic shores. Both the mainland terrain and the ice flows that hindered our entry into the coast seemed to be our first and formidable obstacle. In fact, one of our ships suffered an impact that left it with structural damage to assess. We may need to repair it right here, so we have contacted agents. So these guys, when they made their journey uh, into these ice-packed waterways, they were brave, stupid, but brave. I mean, not I. I no, I, I say that in jest, uh, you know. But like, they they definitely weren't stupid people. But definitely, like, like taking wooden ships like into ice fields like this. Woof. That's that's just that, Oh man, that would give me that gives me the shivers just thinking about it. Ah, no pun intended. ...in Ushuaia to resolve the situation as soon as possible. The terrain itself has proven slightly different from what our cartographic team had delimited previously. However, we have managed to land in the right place. For this reason, preliminary explorations will be aimed at correcting the geographical markings on our maps and tracing the upcoming routes with the greatest possible certainty. The following days have been tremendously successful for us. Being in Antarctic lands during the summer has allowed us to see the horizon more clearly and determine points of interest more rapidly. We have extracted soil samples, hoping to find traces of microscopic life in accordance with variations in atmospheric temperature and the phenomenon of acid rivers that descended from the Australian desert, as documented from 1915 to 1935. Due to the consequences of the war, the record has been discontinued, losing almost 30 years of tracking the advancement of the phenomenon. On the penultimate day of the expedition, we found the object we had been searching for for decades, theorized only theoretically. It was located about 15 kilometers Wait. southeast of the... All right, theorized. Theory or theoretically, I think he actually paused there for a second, realizing what, what um, uh, the uh, what the, the uh, yeah, whatever location area and was in the precise state we anticipated. First, before going into details of its description, we noticed that the surrounding terrain 
was mostly covered with a sandy substance that mixed with a layer of snow. In a certain way, there seemed to be much less moisture, and the snow itself began to acquire different properties, feeling much warmer than <coughs> usual without melting. We took samples to analyze upon our return to determine whether this was particularly solidified water or some substance with a similar appearance. Secondly, we discovered Heldenberg's capsule, theorized in 1876 as a result of acid rivers that could move through the atmosphere from the central core formed in the Gibson Desert Nature Reserve in Australia. This has promoted the overgrowth of some microorganisms that abruptly stop their reproduction when they grow beyond 75 micrometers and are affected by intense cold. However, under certain very specific conditions, they end up proliferating in huge capsules that release spores to continue reproducing in winter seasons. The substance provided by Dr. Nestok Sartok was applied in the surroundings of the capsule with the aim of causing it to perish with the cold that would come in the next five to six months. After this unprecedented success for science, we have embarked back to the Argentine shores to compile the data obtained and publish our findings in the relevant Danish journals. We hope that this discovery allows us to advance in understanding the proliferation of life deep in Antarctica, which due to their extremophile condition could become potential hazards for travelers in the southern world. Eventually, new diseases or creatures that access the ocean and disrupt the food chain could arise. After the Danish exploration in the 1960s, there was never again any mention of studies on microorganisms predicted by the theoretical model of Heldenberg. In fact, Captain Sorensen's crew records were lost until the year 2000 when a German scientific delegation decided to resume those studies, revealing that the information known until then had been incomplete. Captain Sorensen's field notes had been severely altered in their final conclusions, so not all of his discoveries were evident along with the crew's fate, which was very different from the peaceful return described in the writings. The capsule found caused a massive disaster before the Danish scientific team abandoned the site. Apparently, the substance they applied around it only triggered a hyperreaction of the capsule, releasing an unspecified number of organisms that destroyed a significant portion of the men's tents. Uh-oh. Some ended up severely injured, and it's necessary to turn to nearby military bases to seek a solution to what had happened. This led to the decision to bury the capsule and cover it with a massive layer of impenetrable material to prevent further proliferation. You know that's not going to work. It never does. The procedure does. was not without enormous complications, as those creatures adhered to military vessels and through an inexplicable process of synthesis, froze them with the same sandy substance that surrounded Heldenberg's capsule. Holy shit. The members of Captain Sorensen's crew came across one of the creatures, captured it lifeless, and brought it to the Argentine city of Ushuaia for forensic examination. From this point, all traces of the Danish team's investigation were lost, and subsequent investigations were consistently falsified with the intention of erasing several key pieces of evidence. In the year 2000, a federal expedition was authorized to establish an expert opinion on the events of 1962. 
and proceed to examine the areas from which the inexplicable creatures could have proliferated. On this occasion, along with higher quality photographs, unidentified organisms were found completely petrified both on the shores of Antarctica and around the sealed hole. However, the most striking discovery was the presence of different military scientific bases about 300 kilometers south of the German federal team's research area. Since 1986, the U.S. military had been conducting massive excavations that greatly conflicted with both exploratory programs. Of course. Why wouldn't we? von Interesse Nummer 1 Eine formlose Masse Creature of infer Interest Number 1 An amorphous mass with a gelatinous appearance is identified. It is immensely hard to the touch, to the extent that some tools ended up severely damaged when attempting to move it from its position. It remained silent for much of the exploration except for brief moments when it seemed to emit a sound close to a frequency of 14,000 hertz. Damn. Mit einem gelatinösen Aussehen wird identifiziert. Sie ist enorm hart bei Berührung. So sehr, dass einige Werkzeuge schwer beschädigt wurden, als versucht wurde, sie von ihrer Position zu bewegen. Sie blieb während eines Großteils der Exploration still, mit Ausnahme von kurzen Momenten. In denen es schien einen Klang in der Nähe einer Frequenz von 14 0 Hertz abzugeben. Kreatur von Interesse Nummer. Creature of Interest Number 2. It is a structure emerging from very soft and malleable rocks in the sea. At times, it moves with lightness and certain passivity. With each movement, no matter how imperceptible, it emits a sound resembling the crunching of bones. Additionally, it releases an odor similar to ammonia. It is the only one of its kind found on the coast. 2. Es handelt sich um eine Struktur, die aus sehr weichen und formbaren Felsen im Meer auftaucht. Zuweilen bewegt sie sich leicht und mit gewisser Passivität. Bei jeder Bewegung, so unmerklich sie auch sein mag, gibt sie einen Klang von knirschenden Knochen von sich. Darüber hinaus verströmt sie einen Geruch, der dem von Ammoniak ähnelt. Sie ist die einzige ihrer Art, die an der Küste gefunden wurde. Kreatur von... I know what's going to happen while I'm reading. Creature of Interest number three. This figure, located about 50, min 50 meters inland in the sea, displays what appear to be two rocks that change shape throughout the day. Surprisingly, one of them mimics objects that come close to it even recreating almost perfectly the face of one of the expedition members who approached it to take direct samples. It appears harmless, and its apparent function is simple imitation. Here it comes. With each shape change, it emitted a song similar to that of a whale, but with a considerably lower and deeper sound amplitude. <laughs> Interesse Nummer 3. <lacht> Diese Figur, die sich etwa 50 Meter ins Meer hinein befindet, zeigt, was wie zwei Felsen aussehen, die im Laufe des Tages ihre Form verändern. Überraschenderweise imitiert einer von ihnen Objekte, die sich ihm nähern und rekonstruiert sogar nahezu perfekt das Gesicht eines der Expeditionsteilnehmer, der sich ihm näherte, um direkte Proben zu nehmen. Sie scheint harmlos zu sein und ihre offensichtliche Funktion ist einfache Nachahmung. Bei jeder Veränderung der Form gab sie ein... Thank you for the offer, uh, kind sir or madam, but I am good for now. ...niedrigeren und tieferen Klangamplitude von SIG.
All right. So that uh, was The Awakening of Antarctica uh, by Anomaly. Um, and um, let me go ahead and... Um, so uh, sound off in the comments. Like, subscribe, and share. Um, uh, it was kind of weird hearing the German... Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and that's why I read it, uh, read it out for you guys. But, um, if you knew German, then, uh, cool. Um, see you in the next, well, next one, guys. Be safe, happy, and healthy. And, uh, yeah. Have a good night, guys.